Hello, everybody. It's, it's Monday Night Therapy with me, your host, John Johnston, alone again. Ugh. I'm going to have to figure out how to bring my own juice. That's what this is about. This is, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to be doing uh, this show by myself for a while. And I shouldn't pound on the table so much when I'm doing this. Anyway. I don't have anything to go back and forth with witty banner. So, uh, we, you know what? We'll figure it out. I think what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, at 830, I, Aaron's going to come in and we're going to talk about Nebraska baseball because Nebraska baseball is uh, well into their season and doing quite well, I think. But, you know, Aaron has the poop on that. Uh, Men's basketball, women's basketball, their season's concluded this past few days in the NCAA tourney. And I, I was, we were going to do wrestling. I think we'll do wrestling next week when Dylan can join us. He was not able to join us tonight. Uh, Justin Roggy says, I'm here. Let's go. Uh, Justin Roggy also says, Todd better be here today. I don't know if he's going to be here again. We'll see what happens with Todd. I, I, you know, I'll tell you this story. I'll tell you this story. I probably, it's not a story I probably should tell you because it makes me, it probably presents me as kind of an idiot. But, you know, I've never had a problem with that. <laughs> Last night I'm sitting there watching, uh, what was it, Texas A&M and Houston play. And I turn to my wife and I say, you know, I don't I don't like Kelvin Sampson, the coach for Houston. And I'd forgotten that he was the coach for Houston because I forget a lot of th- stuff. And I said, you know, I'd really like to see Texas A&M win this game. And she says, you're not saying that publicly, are, are you? And I said, no, I'm not on Twitter or anything. And she goes, well, you know, you wouldn't want to say that publicly because, you know, the Trev Alberts trader thing. And I, I forgot. I completely forgot. I, at that moment in time, I had completely forgotten that Trev Alberts had left us and gone to Texas A&M. And you know what? I recommend you do that, too, because it's just not worth worrying about anymore. Um, I watched earlier today a segment on some 1620 The Zone uh, you know, radio show where Mike L. Sabir talked about Trev and talked about his reasons for leaving. And if I was more organized, I'd probably post that in the comments section. But um, he talked about, you know, Alberts and that he wasn't that shocked that he left. And he talked about all that, you know, the fact that he he left probably largely, you know what, I'm not going to steal those guys thunder. In short, I think you should go watch this segment. I will try to remember to put the, the link to it in the description on YouTube and in the description on the article I didn't write, but will be out tomorrow morning. But I think that, uh, you know, just forget about that guy. Let's see. Have you guys, let's see, men's basketball concluded their season. NCAA tournament for the first time in 10 years, the best season in 23 years, beat number one for the first time in 40 years. They had court storming going on. They were fun to watch. They finished third in the Big Ten when they were picked to finish 12th. And, you know, they still didn't win their NCAA game, which was extremely disappointing. And, you know, they just got run over. I did the post-game reaction video. I don't think I'd take uh, – I don't think I'd take a lot of what I said back. I think they just let – they just got overwhelmed. I mean, sometimes you run into that. You run into a team where they just, you know, Texas A&M shot three lights out from three, and they were a lot more aggressive. And uh, it was just, I don't know if they could have done anything about it. So looking forward, let's see. Men's basketball is going to lose Casey Tominaga. He's done. And then uh, Josiah Alec is done. Eli Rice is transferring. And, uh, you guys with the farts in the comments. Um, and then uh, who was it? Jamel, Ramel Lloyd, I think, is who didn't really play uh, much this season is gone. I think, you know, there's been rumors about Chucky Hepburn coming back to Nebraska. I have no idea why that is a thing. Hunter Salas is going to come back to Nebraska. Again, no idea why that's a thing. 
uh, not really much behind those, but rumors. Um, I think that they, during the Aussies, I think, here's the thing. Well, let's talk about the women first. Women's basketball, first time they got into the NCAA, first time they've won an NCAA tourney game in 10 years. They made it to the Big Ten tourney championship. Um, it was a disappointing loss they had. They're going to lose Jazz, Shelley. I had notes on this stuff, and now I don't know what the hell I did with them. Because, you know, again, I was sitting and watching Iowa play basketball. It sounds terrible, doesn't it? They're playing right now. Uh, one of the things I will say about the women's journey is this. There, I'll be keep hearing about women's sports growing and growing and growing and the attendance and the viewership getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, you know, it's about time if that's the case that they stop playing the first rounds of basketball on the home courts of whoever they're playing, you know, and start moving them to regionals like they do for the men's. I mean, if you're going to talk about, you know, this equality of men's and women's and treating everybody the same, then treat everybody the same. I mean, you know, it's already, I think women's officiating is already skewed toward the better teams. And I think you see that a lot. I don't know if any of you watched Iowa State Stanford. I thought some of the calls in that game were atrocious. Um <laughs> Oh, okay. What what is this? What is this? James Boardman, do you know what it, you call a hooker that farts a prostitute? That is terrible. I did one of my clients that I work with almost every day. Uh, it, it does dad jokes all the time, and I I feel like I need to go to therapy to get that out of my system. Uh, Nebraska on the basketball women's basketball team. Again, I had this all written down somewhere. Hold on a second. Okay, men will lose Eli Rice, Tominaga, Josiah Alex, Jarrell Coleman, and Ramel Lloyd. And uh, let's see, the women will lose Jazz Shelley, Darian White, uh, Annika Stewart, I believe, was that she announced that she is transferring today. Darian, Darian White was very fun to watch because she was very aggressive. I think she was the most aggressive game in the person in the game they lost next year nebraska will add Britt prince which will be a big ad from the you know i mean everybody talks about her a lot of being one of the best players in the nation uh amaya hargrove and kennedy williams and then allison weedner returns from the second knee surgery so i i think the thing is this i'll conclude basketball kind of like saying this From a person who has been creating Nebraska content for, well, almost 20 years now, I am thankful thankful that we had men and women's basketball programs that are getting successful, uh, that are fun to watch, and that they did as well as they did. Because I don't think we could have taken another season where we just had to pump out Nebraska football content because we would have had to make it made it up. I don't think anybody was in the mood for another full off season of having nothing to cover, but make up stuff about how great Nebraska is going to be next year. Because I think people have just, they wore out of that last year. And I think one more round of that, we're coming into spring football. It's going to be interesting to see uh, how people respond to spring football coverage. I mean, everybody loves football and we know that Nebraska football pays the bills and everything, but uh, listen, there's only so many times you can write the article, uh, you know, five newcomers to watch for or five people that need to show up this spring or need to show up this fall. You know, you can only do that so many times before you go, oh, God, why do I have to do this again? So what what both teams did for me was they gave me something to look forward to that was fun to watch, especially with Tom and Auger around and Jazz Shelley around. But she did kind of disappear in the NCAA tourney game, which was, I don't know, just re really disappointing uh, to, at the end, you know. Uh, Markowski comes back for women. Fred Sacco says, oh, come on, John, I wanted to go for a repeat of a rational undefeated offseason banter championship. I think we, we win that every year, and I think um, – 
I think that uh, we probably already won it this year. Nick Breyer on Facebook says, do you think Nebraska will have a women's wrestling program? You know, I, I've said this a lot. Uh, people ask about hockey, by the way, uh, UNO is UNO hockey. It's a Nebraska hockey program. If you want to have a Nebraska hockey team, you can root for them as they play the Minnesota Gophers in the first round of the NCAA tournament. UNO was in the, is it the NCNS? It used to be the WCHA before the WCHA got broken up and Big Ten hockey became a thing. But uh, UNO made it all the way to the championship game in that and then lost to, uh, oh, come on, they beat North Dakota. Did they lose to? This was just last night. I watched it, for God's sakes. <laughs> this is where I got to get better at the notes thing if I'm going to do this by myself. Oh. Roger Morris's stadium reconstruction, not a topic anymore. What? Denver. They lost to Denver. They, they, my beautiful wife comes in and gives me notes. Thank God for her. Uh, stadium reconstruction, not a topic anymore. Again, I put you back to that Mike L. Severe segment on, I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong because I never get that right, on 1620, where he talks about the fact that, you know, I think the big donors for Nebraska in terms of just pumping out money to projects, I think they're a little tired of it. And, you know, he talks about that a bit. I Again, I've talked about, you know, right now college football is in such a huge – a moment of huge flux. You know, we're going to see in the next, again, said this before, we're going to, we're going to say, God dang it, you guys throw me off. Aaron Rostowski says that John just called me his beautiful wife. No, I did not call you my beautiful wife. Okay. Who the hell was I? We're in a moment of we're in a stage of flux in college football. You know, being ruled as employees is going to be a real thing in two to three years. Uh, I don't see any changes or any way that's going to change. Uh, you've got the Big Ten and the SEC looking like they're going to pull things out of the NCAA and they're going to become this giant mega thing by themselves. Uh, that's a real possibility. Neil at some point has to either complete. This has to be either reined in, and that could happen when they're ruled as employees, uh, but something has to happen where it's not so wild westy. So, uh, okay. I, the other thing is, is I, oh, back to the Mike L. Severe thing. You know, he talked about the fact that the big donors for Nebraska are getting a little worn out with this stuff. And I, I, I think that you have to – we just are on the verge of finishing this big, big red project for $165 million. And I think when you go back to the same people and ask them for more and more and more money, they're going to look at you and go, hey, maybe you could win first. Wouldn't that be nice? You know, you could actually, like, I don't know, produce a winning football team and then maybe, like, give us a couple years and then come back and ask us for $450 freaking million dollars when we know that that's going to end up being six or $700 million at the time you get it done. Plus, there's a lot of question marks about whether or not they needed to do that extensive of a renovation to the stadium. And, and those are the reasons that Trev Alberts left. It wasn't this crap about leadership that he liked to spit out there. I mean, you I said this before, I'll say it again. If he would have been concerned about leadership, he would not have gone to Texas AM. And I'm not bagging on Texas AM saying that. It's just that it, there isn't going to be anything different there for him than it is at Nebraska. Uh Linda Wilkins says, not going to happen, John. It would cause too many Division II and three to drop sports. You know, I there's there's nothing stopping this. This is a legal issue. I don't know if you've noticed this, but the lawyers control the world, at least in the United States now. There's so many lawyers out there. They make the laws. They write the laws. They interpret the laws. And they want everybody to follow the laws. And you, they're going. Student athletes are going to be ruled as employees because that's going to be the law. There's no nobody in Congress is going to step up and change that. So 
they're concerned that too many Division two and three schools would drop sports. Uh, there's probably going to be a lot of Division two and three schools going bankrupt because the upcoming enrollment drops. They, I, the argument against smaller schools or let's say Dartmouth, they're the ones that have been ruled that everything, you know, they're the ones that have won their case and they unionized. And, you know, they can't afford a basketball team if you just looked at it like a business. But they do have a huge endowment because they're Dartmouth, for God's sakes. And a lot of the Division two and Division three schools, you know, some of them are just small and they're probably going to drop their athletic departments because of this. And then some of them are going to look at it and say, well, you know what, the athletic department and being on a sports team provides us with a lot of marketing. So they're going to use part of their endowment costs to um, make up for that shortfall of money. Now, the other argument I'd put against that, because you can see different perspectives on it, is, you know, if you're a Dartmouth or if you're a Cornell or if you're an Ivy League school and you have a massive, I mean, most of the schools have massive billions of billions of dollars of endowments. Are you going to spend it on sports? Because I think for a lot of those schools, their endowments are like dick measuring contests where they just go, well, our endowment is $4.2 billion. How's your doing, Bill? <laughs> You're only at $4 billion or $8 billion or whatever the hell it is. And I don't know if they'd want to just spend money on sports. Uh, that's going to be the, the fallout from this stuff is going to be. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Linda Wilkins also says, I think that's why Trev left. He got told no on the stadium update or if you were selling out, no need to reduce seating. Then, well, that's a good point. I mean, I think the people who sit in the stadium, sit in South Stadium particularly, would say, yes, it needs renovated. But at the same time, we're still selling out every game. So you, it's not like there's a big urgency to do this. Like suddenly, oh, my God, we have to fix things before. Well, they're not broken yet. Fred Sacco says, I got a big endowment, but I don't like to brag. You just did, you liar. Uh, Charles Hollett says, did Dartmouth have huge tracts of land? I don't know that. Okay. Uh, Aaron Keene says, since he has done several interviews, how are we feeling about Dan and as an initial reaction? Well, the opening press conference for Troy Dannon is tomorrow at 2 p.m. Central, and I'm sure it will be streaming, uh, you know, on YouTube and everywhere else. Um, I, I think that I think that there's a lot of people that know this guy. It, it, you know, he he worked in Iowa for a long time. Todd dealt with him uh, with uh, I think Todd, you know, Todd was involved a lot in high school sports. Uh, he was involved in it with him early in his career. I can't remember exactly it was like some women's sport or young women's sport thing. And he said that when he first met him, he knew that he was going to do great things or become, you know, somebody big later. And here he is, the AD at Nebraska now. But that's the other thing. I had to learn to slow down. I, I think that there's a lot of people that know this guy, know what he's capable of, know that he's a capable athletic director type person. He's already been the athletic director at Northern Iowa and Tulane, and I think everybody's pretty comfortable. That's why I think you kind of look at it and you just go, well, bye, Trev. You know, it's, it, we'll send you a card on your birthday. No, we won't. Ah. So, again, the uh, the press conference is uh, tomorrow at 2 p.m. if you want to see it. And I kind of, my initial reaction to that was, okay, are we going to watch a big press conference where he walks in and he looks good and everybody says nice things and we all go, oh, God, haven't we been through this about 30 times? But we still probably have to, well, I still probably will have to part, watch part of it because you want to watch how a guy presents himself. I think right now, I think we are, we're blessed with some people that are very good in our athletic department. You know, Matt Rule is, God help him, he's everywhere. He presents himself extremely well in public, probably better than any coach that, well, better than Tom Osborne. There I sinned. I said that. 
I mean, Osborne wasn't exactly the biggest talker on the planet, and Matt Rule knows what he's saying and how to say it every time. Fred Hoiberg, again, good guy, stands up, doesn't get into a lot of BS, doesn't get really angry at anybody. Same with Amy Williams. So, uh, you know, Will Bolt isn't exactly very public, but uh, I, th I think that he gives, you know, he presents himself very well. And then there's Mark Manning, the wrestling coach, is the other guy I'm thinking of. And uh, I'll say this. If you're around Mark Manning, it's like you get addicted to meth standing next to the guy because he is so full of energy and it's amazing to watch him or to be around him or to talk to him. Uh, okay. Linda says, "Did John, did you see the roundtable of the NIL conference hosted by Ted Cruz in Congress? Uh, not if it was today. If it was a while back, then yes. I think that, uh, I don't know, that's kind of scary. I don't think it's going to go anywhere with Congress. And I, everybody should be terrified of Congress getting involved in anything to do with college football beyond what they already are. Uh, Linda, again. We need more comment. There's a lot of, you know, one of the things is, is we have like, what is it, 377 people watching on Twitter. I haven't figured out how, if Twitter, if you can comment on Twitter and if it brings those comments into the StreamYard comment stream I'm looking at, uh, but uh, it'd be nice, more comments from different people. Not that I have anything against Linda. Linda says he had a good interview on Huskers Online. You know, he called into, uh, Rob, Dr. Rob Zadiska, what is it, Doc Talk? And that was his first interview because apparently they know uh, they know each other. Or I think that uh, Troy Dannon knows Travis Justice from something else. Moonbot7 says, is something up with audio? I don't think so, but uh, I'm sure more people would tell me if there was. Although, you know, I have noticed that this mic is a little bit muffly. And I was thinking that uh, I was thinking that uh, I was going to try a different mic to see if we can get more springy in my voice. <clears throat> All right. What else we got coming up? We got Aaron coming up at uh, 830 with baseball. Ah, women's basketball. Did everybody, have you guys been watching the, the big, the women's basketball tournament? I, it's been, it's been fun. I've enjoyed it. I, I have two questions about it. Number one, Kim Mulkey from LSU. Uh, she did this big spewing press conference thing where she spewed about this negative article that's coming out about the Washington Post. And, you know, probably most people wouldn't have paid attention to it. They probably would just gone, I, I, because I don't know, do you guys read the Washington Post regularly? I mean, it is a big ass newspaper. But her making some big a deal out of it is going to make sure that I read the Washington Post to read this article about Kim Mulkey because she's complaining it's a hit piece and that it's uh, she's going to sue them if they defame her, which is going to be very difficult uh, to do that. But uh, I found myself pondering this question. Iowa's playing right now. I don't know what the score is. But should they win so they can go up against LSU and beat them? Because I really would like to see LSU get beat in the women's tourney. That means I would have to root for Iowa. Does that make me a filthy, horrible person? Or do you just get to set that stuff aside every once in a while and just kind of like go, okay, I can do this. Maybe I shouldn't tell people that. Uh, okay. How many football players run track? I do not know. That's an interesting question. By the way, coordination.com <laughs> coordination.com we are starting our spring previews. So today was a spring, you know, a spring article about our quarterback room. Uh, hopefully tomorrow, if I can get it done, we'll have an article about the running backs and then we'll be previewing each one of the position groups and we'll be starting to talk more about football as we go on. Uh, Clay Castle says, yes, it does. 
Fred Sacco says, yes, it does. Dana Williams on Facebook says, cannot root for those I Weegians. Uh, so I guess the yes, it does was in response to does that make me an evil person? So I guess if I cheer for Iowa and Matt, uh, I won't be telling anybody about it. Louis Brazil says, Kim Mulkey is Ric Flair. You know, that is an interesting uh that's an interesting comparison because I don't remember Ric Flair that great, but I do think this. I think that Kim Mulkey loves all the tension that she gets, even though it's it's mostly because she's just she's so obnoxious and her players are pretty obnoxious as well. And um, I think that, you know, it goes back to the Monty Python skit years ago where one of them said, you know, the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. And I think Kim Mulkey is a person that takes that to heart. John, are you avoiding covering the ladies' bowling team? Let's show them some love tonight. No, I don't have anything on the women's bowling team. <laughs> I wasn't that prepared when I had a sidekick. My God, what do you guys expect from me now that I don't? Oh, my God. Everything filled in there. Women's basketball, baseball. By the way, baseball. Well, Jared, Aaron will be up here in a few minutes. You know, Aaron, if you're on, you want to just show up now, that's fine. Uh... Clay Castleder says Kim Mulkey is a dingbat. I think that's very um, – that's not – I would probably use stronger words than that. I think she's just uh, – you know, I think she's just mouthy and a boorish person, and I think her players reflect her, her program. And it just, just – uh, I don't know. I just – I want to see him get beat. I don't know much about South Carolina, but if South Carolina wins the whole thing, I'm okay with that. Oh, goodness. That's it. That's the. Oh, we still have another minute for Aaron to show up. There he is. Aaron. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Are you ready? Don't bang on your table. Aaron Rostowski is with me. Did I get that right? You did. Okay. Uh, Don Dre says, Todd, is Todd on vacation? Uh, yes, let's just put it that way. Yes, he is. So I, I, I think that Todd might be done doing this with me. I think that it's, uh, we'll just say that for now, and we'll figure out how to plan going forward. Uh, but Aaron is with me, and he's here to talk about Nebraska baseball. Fred Sacco says, I don't like South Carolina either. Their coach is an asshole. Isn't that Don Staley? I think she's – listen, if we're talking about assholes in women's basketball, I think you have to have degrees of, you know, you got Kim Mulkey, you know, Lisa Bluter has joined the conversation lady lately. Uh, I think Don Thomas Staley Green is – I think Don Staley is, is down the list in uh, – okay. Nebraska baseball, how are we doing? Uh, we're off to our best start, and I think since 2008 was what I saw earlier. Uh, I'm actually pretty shocked that we're not ranked right now. I was a little upset when I looked at the rankings today and saw that tomorrow's opponent, Kansas State, jumped in ahead of us, and they're ranked 23rd, and we're just still others receiving votes. So, How do you think that is? Because we're a Big Ten team? Probably there, because yeah, their RPI is not as good as ours. We've got, I think, one fewer loss than them or something like that. But yeah, you know, we're like 10, 10 RPI points above them. So I'm quite confused as to why they is made it another, above us. Is there another Big Ten team ranked? I don't believe so. Uh, Iowa was in there, and then uh, Iowa's not in there anymore. They're yeah. <laughs> but the their record like. 10 and 12 or 12 and 10 or somewhere in that neighborhood, but 
They're, they're still beating up on the Lorises and the Grandviews, all the Iowa NAI schools you can schedule. <laughs> Wait, Charby. Charby says, coming in late, found this channel during football season. Thank God it is good therapy. Well, welcome, Charby. Char, Char or Char? It's probably Char. <laughs> Charby. Yeah, okay. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I cut you off. You should be used to that by now. I'm good at it. <laughs> but yeah, any, not to make this an Iowa show, but anytime they've played a good team, they've only had one good win out of like the probably seven or eight teams that they play that are worth kind of being on their level at the beginning of the season. So there are no big teams. Here's the thing with rankings. I think that, you know, for the years that I covered uh, baseball, I think that uh, what you could always notice is that, like, D1 baseball, who's the other ones? Baseball America? Yeah, Baseball America, the College Baseball it's, Writers Association. Right. And they would only rank USA one big Bay. team, one Big Ten team at any point in time. So, But if nobody's ranked, there's room for us. Okay, tomorrow night we play Kansas State. It's a midweek yep. game. It's a big midweek game. Where's it at? Who's pitching? What's going on? Uh, so we've got Will Walsh pitching. Uh, he's had two really good back-to-back -back starts in the midweek. He went six innings, gave up three runs two weeks ago. And then last week versus uh, North Dakota State, he ended up shutting him out for six innings and had nine strikeouts. And then later on hit a couple of dingers and still isn't getting Big Ten Player of the Week. I don't I don't know what more they want. The guy getting – throwing a shutout and knocking a couple bombs out of right field. What, what more do you want? But, uh, yeah, it's down, uh, down in Manhattan. Okay. So – We've historically played pretty pretty well there. We had a couple bumps, like uh, Bryce Matthews having what five errors in one game or something like that a couple years ago, and so it's it's kind of a always an interesting matchup when the two of us get together on the same diamond. So what is Nebraska's record right now? Seventeen of five. I believe that is correct. Yes. And their RPI is still in the, like the top ten. Yeah, we dropped down from nine to ten over the weekend because New Mexico State's not that that high of a ranking. And what else is coming up? So after K State, we start Big Ten play, and uh, we open up with Northwestern. So should should keep the winds piling up. Hopefully, with that, uh, they've got their new coach, and I was just working on the. The uh, my whole conference wide Big Ten preview has got to come out in a couple of days since we're getting close to conference season, but I haven't quite got to them yet. They were that's actually what I was going to plan on doing tonight. Uh, I know they're doing better than they did last year, but that's they have more than two wins than they did last year at this time, so anything's better than that. But they've got their new coach that came down from Michigan, they who historically has been one of the top recruiters in the country, so it's going to be kind of interesting to see what he can do with that all the money they've got coming into their programs now and northwestern it, it, well at least they won't be a complete shit show yeah exactly here's the yeah, thing took, uh, go ahead they took a michigan kind of number two guy in command that came back with tracy smith who uh, he pulled in number one recruiting class was down at arizona state a couple times and so he's He's been known as one of the best recruiters in the country, especially on the West Coast. So it's going to be real here's, interesting to see what he can do. Here's the thing when it comes to Big Ten baseball that everybody needs to understand. We need the other Big Ten teams to be as good as they possibly can be. You know, normally in other any other sport, I would look at like, you know, like I was talking about women's basketball and the possibility of rooting for women, the Iowa women. Football, you know, they, they screw Iowa and everybody that, that plays them should kick the shit out of them. But in baseball, we want the Big Ten to do well because the typically the RPIs for the Big Ten are so low that they mm -hmm. drag the – there are teams like that in the past – well, they're, maybe this is true for Penn State still, but every year that I covered the Big Ten, uh, 
I would cover Penn step up to a point and it'd be like three or four weeks into the season. And I go, what's the point of this? Why do we even write about these fucking people? They don't care about their own baseball program. They schedule shit. They don't play well. They don't put any effort into making a team. And they lately have done better job, right? They fired yeah, absolutely. Their they, they, I forget what their record is. They're, I think last year at this point, they were something like six and 17. And this year, I think they're probably around like 13 and 10 or 13 and nine. They're doing a lot better than they, they have been in the past few years. So when it comes to RPIs, if teams like Penn State, Northwestern, and teams like that don't schedule better import, better opponents and they don't uh, play better, all that does is drag teams like Nebraska into the freaking RPI shithole. And then when it comes to like postseason play, everybody looks at it and goes, well, you played the Big Ten. They suck. You suck, therefore, by association. And that's one thing that I think has changed for some Big Ten teams. Uh, I don't know. You think it's changed for the better in the last two years? Yeah, the past couple of years, it's, it's, they've been scheduling a lot better. Uh, I think the Rutgers not making the NCAA tournament a couple of years ago, despite having an incredible record and being runner-up in the regular season and in the tournament, them not making the the – NCAA tournament with their RPI kind of woke everyone up that we need to schedule a lot tougher. So the good news is everyone is mostly scheduling a lot tougher in the non-conference. Maryland kind of, they have a great record. They are, haven't played a whole lot of people for what they should be playing, but we're scheduling them, the other teams, but they are definitely not beating them. They're most of the teams have not done great at all in the non-conference. Everyone's, other than Nebraska and Maryland are well below where they want to be, where they preseason people thought they would be. Okay. Pitching. Have we figured it out? We sure have. Uh, Moving Childress over has put Nebraska to where they're number one in the conference, and it's it's not even close. Our ERA for a team is 3.8. Next is Maryland, which is at 4.14. And, you know, that's going to skyrocket as they stop playing the teams in the South and start playing more at their ballpark where it's just a little league field and things are going to get launched this way and that out of their all game. And all their guys are going to be all American hitters all of a sudden after I think they've got one guy hitting above like 310 right now and, and all that. But yeah, definitely pitching. I think the number one thing that Childress said when he came in here is no free passes. We've got, I think it's like 20, 30 less walks than the next lowest team in the Big Ten, too. So we're not striking people out as much as, like, Iowa's probably 80 strikeouts above us, but the no walks is leading to the ERA being just spectacular. Rob Childress is is kind of making the the biggest difference here. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, who is it? So Friday is Brett Sears, who's about the best turnaround I've ever seen and from one year to the next. Last year, he was a huge liability. I cringed every time he went in the game. He gave up a couple a couple really terrible losses where we're up by a couple runs going into the ninth, and like especially Creighton is etched in the back of my mind. Feeling so good there, up a couple runs, and then just everything just went to hell. But he... I think is leading or in the top four of pretty much every single statistical category in the Big Ten Conference. He's number one in ERA, like number two in strikeouts, walks and hits per inning pitch, everything. He's he's up there with anyone. So Friday, they just moved into Friday nights last week after having Cristo there and put Cristo back on Saturday where there's a little less pressure on him. He doesn't have to face the ace every week so i think that'll be better both for sears nebraska and for crystal not to have to deal with going against the ace all the time even though he's the three of his last four starts have been really good but there was one that he kind of was getting back to his old self and walking a few guys and giving up home runs which is was kind of his mo coming into this season but and then 
the whirling spinning gate of that is uh, Sunday starters is we were going to try Mason McConaughey, who is a freshman or a sophomore out of a JUCO that I think he's on something like a 12 inning streak where he hasn't allowed a run. So they are trying the hot hand there to see if, because he really had a good start last week against UNO and went for five innings of squirrels ball. And he's got just a real big sweeping curveball that seems to fool hitters a lot. And then he's, when he was in fall ball, he had that pitch, but he wasn't locating his fastball and it was just getting shelled. But it looks like he's kind of figured that out. And so he could be a real, we can finally solve the Saturday or the Sunday starting position that's been plaguing us for two and a half years. It seems like I think we might be, might be really on to something where we can make some noise. Okay. Well, that brings up the next question. I see that some teams, Maryland, Penn State, Iowa, Illinois, Michigan, well, most teams actually, (laughs) Nebraska, Rutgers, Minnesota, Northwestern, Ohio State have not started conference play. Uh, Everybody else has. What do you think the chances are that Nebraska can win the Big Ten Conference? If we keep pitching like this, and I mean, the bats are still up in the top third, and pretty much everything except for home runs, but with the stolen bases and everything, the offense is still is just fine. They, they've got a real good, real good shot at having a, if not winning the conference, they're getting in the top two. But, yeah, they've – we'll see when Maryland comes. I think it's, what, two weeks out that they come to actually play. I think that'll be a good, good barometer. And then Iowa comes. But we get everyone – all the tough teams – are coming to Lincoln. We don't go on the road to face really anyone that's predicted to be kind of the upper echelon. So that's going to, I think that'll help us a lot. All right. Let's see where everybody else is. Maryland's at 18 and six overall. That's pretty impressive. Is that impressive? They, they, they just... played, they played no one. They've got like the hundred okay. and something ranked schedule in the country. Uh, Rutgers is 17 and seven. I haven't gone deep into them yet, but yeah, they're, they've got a couple of good freshmen that have kind of taken control of their their team. And then they've got that, I, th- I can't remember if he faced us or someone else in the Big Ten tournament there. He was a freshman last year and just went off their starting pitcher and he's going to be tough to beat. Minnesota so, is at 10 and 10. I think this is John Anderson's last year, isn't it? It is. I really want to get up there and. See him one last time because uh, the guy up there is, in Minneapolis for one of the last couple of weeks, I think, that we play him. He has coached Minnesota for 45 years. Yeah, he's coached there and been some sort of involved with the program as a player, as an assistant, as a volunteer for like 50 something years. It's insane. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take some comments. Uh, but Aaron Keen way a while ago said, "John, what flavor of Metamucil are you drinking tonight?" Uh, you know that part of my body works fairly well, and I don't need to. I just <laughs> eat a good diet. I, you know, if you have to drink Metamucil, I suggest you look at your diet. Uh, I don't. You know, I maybe stop. Cut, maybe not eat beef like ninety percent of the time. Like mix in some leafy greens or some stuff like that. But if I were to drink a flavor of Metamucil, it'd be raspberry. Is there raspberry Metamucil? Do you know? I haven't gone down to that section of my (laughs) store in a while. Everyone just brings over the orange. Irish X038 says, my grandmother was John's computer science teacher. I think he's referring to Celia Daly that I brought up last week, who was the head of the computer science department at UNL. Is, it, is your grandmother still around? I wonder if he's still here, can answer that question. If she is, tell her I said hello. She wouldn't remember me. But, you know, I, I will say I will bring up this very kind of disturbing thing that happened last week, and that is that I got a friend request from my mother on Facebook last week. <laughs> and my mother has been gone for like a decade. 
So, you know, just kind of mm-hmm. like, what the hell is this? And it was literally on the on right near the day of her passing. So I was like, what the hell is somebody screwing with me personally? Oh, yeah, weird. Clay Castleder says the old RPI shithole. That's what you should think of it. And you think when you think of Big Ten baseball, you should always keep that in mind. We do not want to descend into the RPI shithole. <laughs> Uh, Clay Castle there also says this. How is baseball ranked? The pros go purely off wins losses. College ranking is mostly political. It's mind bottling, boggling. It could be mind bottling. Tell us what do you, what do you think? How is Nebraska? How is baseball ranked? It's definitely they they favor the the southern teams. They beat up on each other and still get high rankings, but uh, just. They they do a lot of history, how your team or conference has failed historically versus kind of how you're doing until you make huge waves and then they can't ignore you like Indiana back in the day or uh, Michigan a few years ago. Something you can't ignore, then then you'll get a ranking for sure. But otherwise, like Dallas Baptist is ranked right now and they're they were kind of hot a couple years ago and they're not as great this year. They lost their best starter who was a former Husker. But it's yeah, it's hard to they go by wins losses and RPI and then just kinda how much they favor the old historic teams. Magic eight ball. Uh excuse me. Clay Clay Castleder says can you play collegiate baseball if you have a pro contract? Excuse me again. No, but I wish I wish that college baseball would run the way that they progress from college to pro the way hockey does. I think that would be a much better way to do it than kind of the football basketball model where you your eligibility is up and you can go after your junior year. And How does hockey do it? Hockey, you can get drafted at any point after your, I think, is it 18? I forget. But you should know this. You're a Minnesota guy. Yeah, but, but I, I I didn't get to play hockey, and none of my kids played hockey. So there's a nuances to hockey that, uh, you know, I just don't I don't. I don't so you can kind of have your your rights drafted out of high school, and then you can either choose if they think you're ready to either just go into their system or go up to their the NHL right away. You can sign sign with them and go. Otherwise, you can. Sign with them, sign like a, I don't know if it's called like a futures contract or something, and then still go to play hockey collegiately. And then uh, whenever they you decide you're ready and they decide you're ready, you can just leave after your freshman or sophomore year. Or I know one guy, I think from Minnesota, just did it a couple of years ago, just halfway through the year, decided, eh, I'm ready, and just left like halfway through the season. <laughs> really? That's. I remember reading something on that. I don't know the, all the circumstances, but but yeah, whenever you're ready, you can go. I think that'd be a lot better baseball model with all the all the differences from one year to the next, and that because that would that would help college baseball a lot too, and not have the guys stuck in the minors on low A ball for three four years before they even make any noise, kind of in the higher higher levels. Charles Hullett says, didn't we say that at the end of last season that Childress was the best coach to coach pitching? We sure did. The best and coach, it, the good coach. There's a Dr. Seuss in there somewhere. What's the difference between uh, last year and this year with regards to pitching, do you think? Uh, he's definitely, his whole thing is no free passes. You're going, you're throwing strikes. You're not trying to throw sliders down into the ground a whole bunch to try and get him to swing and miss, you're you're going after him. I mean, occasionally he'll do the the front door, everything dipping out and try and get you to swing and miss with a few guys, but they really uh they really are focused on being vanilla. Don't try and think outthink yourself, just throw strikes. Let guys hit if they are gonna hit, which has led to a couple problems with with Cristo in particular, but I mean, everyone else has vastly improved their numbers from last year to this year. Angela Matney asks, by the way, hello, Angela, who is our biggest rival in baseball? 
I saw that earlier and was trying to think. Um, definitely Iowa's up there. Is that Iowa well. just because they're Iowa? We really haven't established this in the Big Ten after all these years, have we? Yeah, we've taken a couple of good teams to Iowa and just like, the best team we had taken, we were going to Iowa City and my dad and I actually went there and we're all excited and things were going so bad that the pitching parents and the hitting parents were about ready to fight each other in the parking lot. And we had to like kind of scoot off to the side to like get around them to not get in the middle of a big brawl. And it was, it's rough. So I, Iowa definitely messes with our minds, but I mean, Purdue and their tarp, I, I just can't get over it. <laughs> I just want to crush them. Okay. okay. Clay says, gotta be Creighton. I don't think okay. it has to, I, is it? They're up there. I think it should be a conference team. Because, yeah, I, mean, I think you're right. But Because winning the conference, you know, I mean, go back years. Are this, the years just fly by. When you get old, they, they just go. Oh, they just, <laughs> what year is it now? I don't know anymore. Uh, but, you know, I mean, whenever Texas came to town, my God, that yeah, was a Texas, thing. That was just a Texas massive, massive, giant. Everybody was like, yeah, you know, and now it's just like, you know, it's I, I get that we want to beat Creighton because they suck. Yeah, Damn Creighton Dayton. with longevity is definitely in there. But Clay yeah, Castle, there comes back with John. You don't make the rules. I do too. He'll turn this damn podcast around. Yeah, I get get in the line or something. I don't know what that was. <laughs> well, James Wardman says Creighton too. I think that you know what? If that's our rival, that's sad. Because it really does need to be a conference rival, I think. And maybe this is something to look forward to with four teams joining the Big Ten from the pack. You know, maybe one of them will become our villain. Yeah. You know, because That'd normally, be I mean, if you have a rival, if you really have a rival in sports, it's not just about sports. It's about your morality versus their morality. This is why Creighton is our rival in basketball, because they're evil i've been trying to cut down on the swearing but they're they're fucking evil that's what creighton is they're just evil and you know nebraska is the goodness of everything and then there's those omaha rich people that are evil that's why they're our rival it's not just to do with basketball and we really haven't we really haven't found that you know rutgers you know what was it two years in a row they swept us yep at our home stadium with you in attendance yeah, when I was there. <laughs> you know, they're not evil. Rutgers isn't evil enough in baseball to be a good rival. So maybe, you know, one of these teams, maybe we can learn how to hate USC or something. I don't know. Ah. All right, I was going somewhere before this. And then I, I lost track. Oh, we still had some comments. Hey, who's our biggest rival? Uh, Jason Reeves says, damn it, I came through here to mourn the end of basketball season, maybe turn the corner, pull our head of, uh, out of our, pull our head out of asses and focus on friggin' football. Shit, here's Brutus, love you, bra, but he wanted to focus on football. We're going to be focusing on football soon because it's the springtime. Uh, let's see. And we, we have to focus on football because Nebraska football is still the biggest thing on the planet ever. And, uh, you know, and we want it to be good. Okay, Charles Hullett, I saw a rumor that Kite Kese is petitioning for another season. Any truth to that? Uh, I haven't seen anything about that, and I don't I don't know if he can. I don't think I haven't that. I have heard that, that, but that'd be nice. It would be nice. I think that, uh, you know, watching him play is probably one of the most – well, it is. It's been the most fun experience in uh, Nebraska basketball history. I, I, we could ask about what other players were fun to watch like that. Uh, and I don't, I don't think there's anybody that's been, you know, that dynamic or that much loved by a crowd. And maybe that's because we needed somebody like that. You know, that fate and destiny had brought us together with some Japanese kid that showed up and could barely speak English when he started and won all of the, took all our hearts and put them together in a big sweaty pile so we could find a sweaty pile of love for basketball. It's kind of creepy, isn't it? I still remember my favorite thing of his is the first time that he showed up, I think, for 
actual in classes and gonna be practice is gonna start. He was on like some twenty hour flight from Japan to LA to here. He gets into the gym, he's still got all of his clothes on, he's got his backpack on and coach just throws him a ball and he drills five three pointers in a row without even hitting the rim. <laughs> That's insane. Uh Husker Chuck says I'm so old I remember when Creighton sucked. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I guess it's a good thing that they've gotten decent. You know, you do need your opponents to be, um, you know, you need them to be good. Otherwise, you go down that RPI shithole. <laughs> All right. Do we have more comments? Yes, we do. Got that one. Husker Chuck asks, how the hell is Florida a top 10 team? Don't you have to win games? I saw they beat LSU on Friday. I didn't. And then I was watching. I thought they were winning Saturday, too. I didn't see the end of it, though. They may have blown okay. it. Here is currently D1 baseball's top 10. Arkansas, Oregon State, Clemson, Texas A&M, Tennessee, Florida, Vanderbilt, LSU, Virginia, and Dallas Baptist. So what's the common denominator amongst most of those teams, Aaron? Way down south. Yeah, they're all SEC schools. You know, Arkansas, Texas A&M, Tennessee, Florida, Vanderbilt, LSU. Yeah, I mean, if you lost, you lost to the number four team, so you, you should still rank in the top ten. So That's why you get to stay up there. And, it, you know, some, we talked about it being political earlier, and it, it is a lot on, um, on that. Uh, okay, we're coming to the end. Husker Chuck says, what is, John, what is coming up on hardcore history? You know, I have a problem with hardcore history. He's talking about hardcore college football history, my other channel. And what I have a problem with is this. I start reading about a subject I want to cover. And then like three days later, I'm still reading about it. And it's still, I'm still finding interesting stuff. Uh, one of the next videos in the script I have in the works right now is about a coach named Gil Doby. And, you know, there are... 578 people online with us right now, and I'm guessing that there might be one of you that's ever heard of Gil Doby. But I, I'll tell you what, I'm going to pull this up. Give me a moment, and I'll give you a. I'll give you the opening. Okay, this is Gil Doby, the coach. He coached for over a period of 33 years, tallying a head coaching record: 182 wins, 45 losses, and 15 ties. For a winning percentage of 783, he had 14 undefeated seasons, teams in those 33 years. He didn't lose a single game in his first 11 years of coaching. He is a Hall of Fame member of every co co school he coached at, and he was an inaugural Hall of Fame. You know, when they opened the College Football Hall of Fame in 1951, he was one of the first, he was elected in the first class. Won national titles 1921, 1920. Oh, coming to the end of the show, I've lost my English. <laughs> Won national titles in 1921, 1922, and 1923. You'd think you'd heard of a guy that was that good, but mostly nobody has. And it, he's just disappeared from history, and he is an incredible coach. And he had the nickname Gloomy Gil Doby because he was so pessimistic. Uh, one, one time, I think it was Pop Warner came up to him after Pop Warner beat him and said, you know, your backs were really quick. It was a marvelous to watch how quick your backs were getting off the line, to which he responded, that just means they got to the tacklers faster. <laughs> he was so negative that that's why they called him Gloomy <laughs> Gill. But that's, that's going to be one of the next videos, and then I'm going to turn around and finish that series I started on the Carlisle Indians. Uh, let's see. James Wardman comes back and says the rumor is Casey is petitioning for a hardship season that occurred in junior college. Apparently there is a precedent for the language barrier. Well, that's interesting because who's not for that? I'm all in. I mean, you know, another year at Casey Tominaga would be like a big heap and glass at raspberry Metamucil <laughs> if you're having those <laughs> kinds of problems. All right, let's see. Um, we got anything else in there?
I don't know if we do. Let's see. Uh, Clay Castle says, what are your thoughts on Jay Scrooge? I thought I gave them. Didn't I give them? That they're uh, evil. The first? They're, they're evil. Yeah. They're not, I don't. But is it, who's, who is it? Who's worse, Iowa or Creighton? Uh, Iowa, I understand why they're fans. I, I, I don't understand Creighton. <laughs> All right, I think uh, I think that's going to do it. Uh, thanks, to Aaron, for joining me. We're going to have you back periodically throughout baseball season because it's baseball season, and I know that every year, every year there's a certain contingent of Nebraska's fan base that believes we should be going to the College World Series. And I think the thing is, is uh, you know, in order to get to the College World Series, we see it's going. World, the College World Series, you first have to like play regionals and super regionals. And you know, what we want this season is for Nebraska to host a regional. Yep. Okay. And then I've one last thing that came of the last couple of weeks is with our change in uh, leadership, we need to go back to the, the original oh. baseball and. That's none, you know, that none is, of this uh, iron end crap anymore. Yeah, here's the thing. If you explain that a little more for people that are ignorant. So sure, the, they've had sure that, yeah. They've had this and uh as far back as I can see in their archives, which is Bob Sir, which was like what, nineteen forty one, I think. And then uh with Trev, he wanted everyone to have this end. So let's so branding, every, branding was consistent across the board. Yeah, everyone was consistent in every sport. And so then this year, finally, the baseball team did away with this end and got the really wide one, and it just looked awful, and I hate it. And it reminds me of the, what was that, 2001 football uniforms with the big red stripe down the side that we no one ever talks about. <laughs> I hate it. Well, I, I, have, has anybody asked if that's what they're going to do is bring – Bring back the regular. I tried to get Todd to run down on the field after uh, last last game he was there and see if he could go ask Bolt if he was ready to change it back. If they just toss all those hats in the trash, they probably they should have spares from last year. I would think they don't have to wait till next year. Red Zacco comes in with Trev can stick his branding up his ass. Well, there you go. Uh, Husker Chuck apparently has to go back to therapy now that you mentioned those uniforms because he says, oh, God, those <laughs> white stripes shaking my head. All right. That's it for tonight. Thanks, to Aaron, for coming on and joining me and not leaving me all by myself. Uh, let's see. Through the off season, I'm going to, you know, when we, we're going to have Aaron back. Well, next week, we, I hope to have Dylan on to talk about wrestling and what happened at the end of the season. Uh, I'm going to try to get guests because uh, I'm not going to do this all the time by myself. And we'll just see what kind of guests we can come up with. And and we'll, we'll try to make it as interesting and as entertaining as possible. And there you go. That's all I know for now. Maybe I'll come up with an outro too, an actual outro, other than good night, Aaron. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>